So that's, I guess you can already see our faces. So this is redundant. Um, so the agenda, the goals is to introduce a bit about us, um, computer vision problem flow, the process by which you build a model. Um, and then I actually have like more slides and content about the rest of the process, but we'll break halfway through like the presentation and just jump to the live demo because Brad will take us through kind of the, uh, the process live of doing it. Um, so in general, the live demo and what we're going to do today is train an object detection model. And I'll break down a bit more about what specifically object detection is here in a second to identify hand gestures. Um, but first, you know, I'll talk about what computer vision is and how we're seeing it be used. Um, computer vision at its core is basically just teaching computers to see images like humans can, uh, if not better. And I mean, the more perhaps precise definition is processing and deriving inference and insights from image and video data. That's kind of all it is at its core. Um, it made a big leap recently with the advent of, of deep learning and neural networks because of the ability to process, um, instead of memorizing individual pixels to actually learn representations of objects. Um, now there's a couple of different vision problem types. This slide here is not representative of all of them, to be clear, um, but it does give a good overview, okay? So in the furthest left, classification problems, these are probably the, like the, you know, the hello world type problem you've heard of, of like, uh, this photo contains a cat or this photo contains a dog, right? There is a, a cat in this, and it's basically a, a tag for the entire photo level, right? So classify the contents of the entirety of this photo. Take one step to the right, and if you add classification and localization, you get not only cat, but where in the image that cat is with the bounding box. You take one more step to the right, and you get object detection, uh, which basically is classification and localization, but of multiple objects and of multiple classes. So in my example here, I've labeled the cats and then also the bull. And you'll notice that it's not coincidental that these are boxes. Um, the way that uh, under the hood things work out, it's much, much, much more computationally efficient to find uh, non-sloping lines, which means that the um, processes can be happening real time and much, much faster. We take one more step to the right and we get to semantic segmentation. And so that's where you see almost like the pixel masks, right? So you can see my poorly drawn masks over top of the cats and then the, the bowl there. Now, a pretty good question is like, why don't we frame every problem as a semantic segmentation problem? Because you can see by definition that like semantic segmentation in some senses encompasses everything to the left. Like if we know the mask of representation of something, then we could probably classify it. And the answer there is kind of the same reason that you don't store every number as a float, uh, right? Like you don't want to use a more complex tool than is necessary for the job is, is one reason. The second is speed. Um, the algorithms and so forth that you need to use get increasingly more intensive the way you work your way from left to right in this, this diagram here. And then the last uh, major reason is um, the data preparation requirements for things in the furthest right are just way more intensive. And so for a variety of reasons, if you're doing things like counting objects, object detection is usually the best place to go for a lot of those types of problems. And that's also, we'll, we'll do a demonstration of object detection here today. Um, some computer vision problems that uh, I didn't explicitly call out here are key point detection and like pose estimation. So just before we got on, individuals were talking about the Nintendo Switch, right? And like the different types of exercise movements. And Sam was like, oh, yeah, but my, my wife thinks that the movements that are involved would actually like injure people. You can envision a future where there's like an application that looks at, you know, where your elbow is relative to your wrist, relative to your hip and informs and says, you know, you can make better, better movements. That's an example of like a key point detection problem named from finding the key points on someone's, uh, in this case, body. But key point detection is what powers face ID just as much as um, some, some other things. So that's kind of like the lay of the land of like problem types, if you will. And as I mentioned today, we're gonna dive deep into object detection. Um, the chat's empty, but if there's thoughts, questions, as I mentioned, feel free to, to interject. Um, now, the reason that like computer vision and kind of what's happening under the hood is you can tell that this is a representation of, well, it is actually a photo of Lincoln. It's just, you know, like an 8-bit representation of Lincoln. And the way, of course, that our computers 
and digital representation of photos is based on the uh, 0 to 255, um, determining the darkness of any given pixel, right? Zero being completely black, 255 completely white. And what our algorithms and our computers see is the thing on the furthest right. And of course, what humans see is things on the furthest left. When you do this in RGB, you just have this, but three, right? One for red, one for green, one for blue. Um, and what a lot of what computer vision does is it enables the computer or the algorithm of, of choice to learn, you know, when I see, for example, when I see these really, really dark pixels at the bottom here, that must be like the chin, right? Uh, or when I see uh, kind of the brighter spots towards the top, maybe that's like the forehead. And pretty soon you can kind of see how under the hood, um, a lot of these algorithms work to understand the relationship of numbers, but as we see them, of course, of, of visually rich representations. And so when I mentioned earlier that clip, the drawing contest that we all did um, has like feature embeddings. Um, uh, that's kind of what I was getting at here was that like each feature is, you know, a vector, but you could have a lot of those features and pretty soon you have a matrix and then pretty soon you have an N dimensional space. Um, and that's what happens under the hood of when we're comparing different feature vectors. We're just comparing how close the numbers are of one to another. It's a rash oversimplification. Happy to kind of go deeper into some of that, but for now, that's that's where we'll leave things. Um, so, I mean, vision's everywhere. Um, at Roboflow, we've actually had like 20,000 developers now build all sorts of different stuff. Um, I mean, in Iowa, we've seen companies do stuff like uh, identifying specific parts for repair. Uh, we've seen companies build for uh, weed versus crop detection. Uh, we've seen companies do insurance work of like uh, quotes and estimates from like photos of roofs and identify where there's roof damage. Uh, we've seen fish measuring. That's one of the bolded ones here. I think that was fun. It's kind of a fun use case. Um, all these sorts of things. I mean, really all the way down from the microscopic level, all the way up to like telescopes. <laughs> if there's an image, there's probably interesting things that you can do uh, with, with vision. Um, so like an aerial imagery, this is actually a photo that um, Brad and I captured with a drone um, at Lake Panorama, um, Western Iowa, West Central Iowa. Um, you can do cell counting, the microscopic example, uh, or like mass detection. Here is a uh, Brad and I when we, it sounds really dumb now, and maybe, maybe it was then, but we went to Taiwan in February when we were working on RoboFlow for a period of time. So we got to uh, enjoy a lot of masks travel during that, that period of time. Um, somehow did not get sick. Um, okay, so in general, that's like computer vision at an overview, but like, how do you use it? What do you do? What's actionable about what I just said? The, oh, Paul, Paul wrote gas leak detection with visual cues. Um, so we saw like a Fortune 50 oil and gas company. They had these cameras that were pointed at their facilities and they were actually, those cameras were actually used for like unauthorized access. Like if you saw someone enter they had someone watching those feeds, but some smart like enterprise and engineers were like, this is pointed at our infrastructure. We can probably look and see, is there like a big black splotch on our pipes? And if there's a big black splotch on our pipes, then send a notification, send an alert. So that was like the interesting use case that we saw in, in that domain. Paul, if that answers your, your question. Um, now, basically like when you solve any vision problem, you start with, you know, clearly defining, like most things, the, the problem statement at hand. I want to count the number of boats in my drone images. I want to count the number of cysts in my, um, in, in these cells that I've run a, an experiment on. Um, and then you collect images, collect data for that given problem. Uh, so maybe video converted to images or a collection of images. We do data preparation and that's kind of like generous to put everything into this bucket. There's a lot of things in there. There's the annotation process the pre-processing. So images could be of different sizes and we need them to be consistently one size for our model to, to handle. Um, there's augmentation. So you could have an image that's captured in, in one scenario, but your users could be in a room that's randomly brighter or darker or like rotated at different angles. And then you train the model and you deploy the model. So this is sort of the end-to-end -end process by which we create and use any sort of vision problem. Um, now, actually, this is where it's probably a good point to dive into doing things 
um, live, I do want to flag that like I'm very, very happy to share the, the rest of the less engaging, frankly, like slides of like what happens next? What should we be thinking about? What are sort of annotation tips and sort of, sort of these types of things? Um, but in fact, this is where we have a live demo of building with RoboFlow and specifically doing vision in the browser. So I'll stop my share. Um, I'll pause if there's any kind of high level thoughts, questions, et cetera. Well, uh, Brad dropped a link. Yeah, so I just dropped a link to a demo. I'm going to share my screen also. But if you all pull up um, that on your page, um, we're going to do this kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie. We're going to start at the end, and then we'll go back to the beginning and kind of show you how it works. Um, so if you open up that link, that's what I'm pulling up here. Um, this is actually going to load a model that I trained earlier today um, from some webcam photos. Um, and if you hold your, your thumb up, you might see an up or a down um, uh, box. But you might not because I only trained this model on photos that I took of myself. Um, so what I'm going to have you guys do is uh, help me out by helping me collect a data set. So if you click into that window and hit the space bar um, and then find, uh, put, put your hand up in a thumb or a not thumb that is, is recognized, and hit the space bar and save a picture um, of like the model failing essentially. So find something where it's doing poorly at. Um, and then I'm going to jump over here into RoboFlow and I'm going to create an Iowa JS thumbs data set. And the things we're going like, to label in here are called thumbs. Um, and then I'm going to enable this upload via email feature. And that gives me an email address that I'm going to drop in the Zoom chat. So when you guys get some good photos, um, go ahead and drop them uh, in your email client and email them here. How do I get back to the chat? Um, let's see. You have to find the Zoom bar, mouse over, click more, click chat. <laughs> My Zoom bar is missing. Uh, Joseph, could you type this up or I'll, I'll type it into Slack for you and could you copy paste it over into the Zoom chat for me? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Got cool. it. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, go ahead and if somebody sends some images to there, those will show up and I'll, I'll show you, uh, what we're going to do with those. I'll see if I can grab one too. So we're trying to find instances where it mislabels a, a thumbs up or thumbs down? Correct. Yep. We're going to teach this model to be um, more accurate um, and ha have less edge cases. Um, so if you what can check it? it by messing with the light or getting a different angle. Um, and, and to be clear, a failure includes not finding your thumb. Yeah, I was about to ask. Yeah. Oops, I did it just to roboflow.com. So you guys are probably going to get a picture of my thumb in your unknown addresses. All right, mine's sending. I wonder if this is actually going to work. You got to love live demos. Well, all right. I, You're <laughs> going to have a lot of fun with my like weird misshapen thumb because it doesn't seem to think I have a thumb. <laughs> yep, me too. Nice. I, I mean, I like I said, I only trained this on, on mine. So I actually had to change my shirt to what I was wearing when I took the photos earlier. <laughs> Uh, to get it to work for the demo. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get some good training data, hopefully. Um, so I dropped mine in here because it looks like the email parse is going slow. Um, so we just went through the first part of the process that Joseph described of collecting images, in theory, if those end up coming through. The second part is to label um, the data set. Um, and so here I have an example where the model didn't find this thumb. So I'm going to label it, and I'm going to call this one. This is kind of a thumbs up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that I want my model to find this thumbs up. So uh, had those images come through, uh, let's, I guess, see if they did. Oh, yeah, here we got some images. 
Um, so the idea would be to go through here and find everybody's thumbs and label them. Um, the nice part about using machine learning is that I can also come in here and find that model that I trained earlier on the thumbs that you guys are using um, and use that as a starting point. Um, and so um, that way I can just correct the model versus um, having to start from scratch. Um, but since we, we labeled most or we collected mostly error cases, um, the model uh, isn't going to find most of these um, unless you had some, some false positives where we're going to remove what it says or change the position of it. Um, so it looks like we have nine images that people emailed in that have come through so far. That's good diversity getting close to the camera. How precise do you need to be with the bounding box? Like you're um, pretty. It, it depends on how close you want your model to get. So if you need really high precision, you want to be really close to the bounding box. Um, if you don't, if you just want it to like find it in general, so this is great. So I can mark this as a null one um, and tell it there's nothing here. That's important to tell your model there's not always going to be a thumb. Um, so we have some people that are like really um, concerned about like the exact pixel values of their bounding boxes. So they need to be very precise in the labeling. Um, if you just want a, a general ballpark figure, um, it doesn't really matter. You're, you're training your model by example, so it's going to learn to replicate what you do. If you're not very precise, your model won't be very pre precise. And hopefully, if you are precise, your model um, will. Uh, oh, here we've got a, a whole bunch more that came through. Um, so I'm not going to actually make you guys watch me go through and label all these. Um, this is a, a good opportunity to like share some, share with your team and split up and divide the work. Um, otherwise, like you can outsource this to other companies that will hire people like in the Philippines to label your images for you. Um, so I'm going to take. Brad, you did, yep, go ahead. Can you can you can you share this data set with with the team and I'll label while you keep going? Oh sure. Um, yeah. So maybe once we're done um, with this, Joseph will uh, have the rest of our la images labeled for us. Um, so that was step two: was annotating our images, getting um, our model some data that it's going to learn by example from. Um, the next step is like the data prep preparation stuff. Um, and so some of the things that you want to do. Um, are here. Um, so we have all these steps of like essentially image magic as a service um, where you can pick all sorts of different settings. Um, Tile is one that we used with the aerial imagery. So we ended up with 20 megapixel images, um, but we wanted to like actually find things that were quite small. Um, the, the two uh, that are selected by default are the ones that I'm going to leave on. Resize is super important. Um, this is the one that really affects the speed of your model. So the bigger the images that um, you, the, the bigger the model is, the bigger the input size of the model is, um, the more pixels it has to look at. Um, and then it has to do all sorts of different operations on them. Um, and so 416 is a pretty good size. Um, fun fact, the reason that people use 416 um, is because it's easily divisible by 32. And uh, because, so um, hence power of two and, um, or not power of two. Uh, basically, it makes the math easier for them to do behind the scenes. And somebody did it in a research paper a while back, and now a lot of people use 416. So you'll see that number quite often. Um, the next thing that we need to do um, is, in, is expand the size of our data set. Um, so with this example, um, you really don't care whether you know your thumb is on the left side or the right side of the screen. Um, you, so uh, we're going to add a horizontal flip to show our model examples of both of those and tell it not to be um, sensitive to the exact orientation. Um, and essentially, this is getting us more training data for free without having to take more pictures. So we only took um, 34 photos, but we're going to create multiple versions of each one so that our model has more data. Um, in, in general, it's better to get like actual diverse um, training data. Um, but augmented images are better than no images at all. Um, so I'll zoom these in um, a little bit as well. Um, let's see what else. Um, I think rotation would probably be pretty good. We want to rotate a little bit because you know if your thumb isn't perfectly straight up or down um, or exactly the way that people have done these in the photos, we still want it to work. Um, I'll change the color in case like the white balance of the camera was off a little bit. Um, let's see what else would be useful for this brightness in case the, the room is lighter or darker. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is show the model um, examples of how these images might look in the real world so that it doesn't 
um, just memorize the exact images that we put in. Um, so I'll go through a couple more of these options um, while Joseph finishes labeling. Joseph, how, uh, how far have you, oh, I see you, I see you going. Um, and then we're going to- 31 of 34. Nice, I think, I think you're going to make it. Um, so I've increased this to 10 versions per image. So for each of these 34 images that you guys emailed, um, we're going to generate 10, um, and it looks like they're all in the training set, which I won't be a problem because what I'm going to do. Uh, generally, so um, the way the machine learning model works is you set a certain aside, uh, amount of data aside for it to learn from. So those are the ones that's going to look at and try and replicate. You set some aside for validation, which is how you're going to um, learn at, as the model trains how well it's doing on images it's never seen before. And then you set a certain number aside that you're never going to show your model at all. So there's no chance that it's memorizing them. And that's how at the very end of the process, you're going to evaluate, like, is it actually going to work well in the wild? Um, OK, so we've got our data set. Joseph helped label it. Um, I'm going to go ahead. And I, what I did this morning was took 66 images just of me. And this is where I mentioned you know, they were all me in the same shirt. Um, and I'm going to combine our 34 with that 66. And that's going to give us a new data set of 100 images of thumbs. And I should have thought ahead because all those, oh, that did work. Cool. Um, cool. So we've got our 10 times um, 80 uh, training images. You only augment the, the ones that your model is going to be learning from. Um, so we've got 800 plus 14 plus 6 gives us 820 total images. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and hit generate. Um, this is going to take a, a point in time snapshot. Um, so. You want to think about training machine learning model kind of like a, doing a science experiment. And so you want reproducibility. And so by freezing this in time and knowing the exact 820 images that I have, the split between the training, validation, and test set, um, it means we'd be able to experiment with different machine learning models and see which one works um, and be confident that the improvements that we're getting are because of the changes that we're making versus some random distribution of um, like the images that we picked or the um, specific transformations. So this went through and generated those 820 images. And if you look through here, um, you can see that um, we have those transformations applied. So they've been stretched to square. Um, they Some of them have been made brighter or darker. Um, this one's been rotated a little bit. And importantly, the bounding boxes went along with that. So this is still kind of telling the model where the thumbs up, thumbs down are. Um, so now we've got a data set, uh, and we're going to train a model. Um, and so Here's where you can branch in the flow. So if you want to be like a, um, an advanced user or a researcher, you might want to um, pick one of these formats that lets you um, train a model custom on your own. Um, and RoboFlow actually has an entire library of open source models from papers um, where you can um, get a Jupyter notebook or a tutorial. Um, and so if I click into to one of these notebooks, um, you'll see that the the first step is to get your data into into the into the uh, notebook. Um, so you clone clone the repo and you're going to look for a link that looks like this. Um, so in the app, I can come over here, and that particular model was called Scaled Yolo V4. Um, and so if I pick the Scaled Yolo V4 format and click Get Link. Um, that's going to go ahead and zip, uh, export these uh, annotations in the right format for me to use with that, post them, and then give me this link that I can go ahead and paste over here in this notebook, um, and then follow the tutorial and go through and get a, a model that I can use um, on my own. Um, what we're going to do, though, is, is use RoboFlow um, to do that. And we've um, programmed our own models on the back end, um, where we've kind of handled all the complexities of having to learn about the machine learning stuff and having to figure out how to deploy it. Um, and so we have a, a system where um, you can train a model and you'll just get back an API, which we're going to see here in a second of how to, how to use the model. Um, so here, I'm going to actually go ahead and start from the thumbs data set that I trained earlier today. Um, so we added 36 images. We, we don't really need to learn everything about what is a hand again or what it, what, you know, what's the difference between a person in the background. Um, so by starting with the data set that I trained before, um, and I have some other ones in here that were options, um, but this is the most recent one that I trained, 
um, it'll speed up the training time um, and I should get a, a bit of a boost um, in performance. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick that off. Um, this is gonna spit up a cloud server with a GPU um, and go ahead and go through all of the training process. And then it'll shoot me an email um, when it's done training with the link um, to, to grab my API uh, and, and do inference or to do that TensorFlow.js in the browser stuff. Um, so here, we're gonna wait for that to train. It probably won't be done by the time we're done with this session, um, but I'm gonna go back to the model that I trained earlier to show you um, how to actually use that. Um, so you can see once it gets done, it gives you the, the percentage accuracy that it got and some of these other training metrics, but it also gives you a bunch of links that you can use. Um, so um, this one is um, a curl command that you can run from your command line. Um, so from any programming language or um, just from your computer, you'd be able to get predictions. Um, you can go to an example web app, um, and this would let me upl uh, upload images directly in my browser. And this is how I would create um, a model. Um, this is all the code to create this inference side of things. Um, so if I browse and go to my download section and see that picture that I emailed, I believe there it is. Oh, it's on my desktop. So this photo that I uploaded earlier, um, I can add it to here and hit go. Um, and it runs through, this is the code to send it to the server and the server sends back the prediction. Um, somewhere over here is where is the API link that it's going to, uh, but I'll show you the, the sample code in a second. Um, and you can see it didn't get my thumb, um, but it did get a, a thumbs up. I can turn on and say, show me the labels and make that a little bit thicker. And um, you can see that, oh, I, th it detected as a down thumb. That was why I screenshotted this one. So hopefully our new model will get this better because we screenshot or we uploaded this to the new data set. It's got this as an example of, oh crap, I was wrong the first time around and it should hopefully learn to, to do better. Um, but the fun part um, is, to, is to try with the webcam. And so this is what we did earlier. This is the exact same link that I sent in the Zoom chat. Um, and some of you might have noticed that up here on the right side, there's a get code link. And that, this is all the code that you need to load it into your web app. Um, so you add the, the script from our CDN, and this has all of the um, TensorFlow code and all of our custom code to, to load the model um, and do some, some fancy transformations and stuff. Um, you auth with your um, public key. You tell it which model. Um, so this was my thumbs dash four model, you can give it a version. So if I can't come in here and I wanna do another test, let's say I wanna do different augmentations or I wanna add images directly to this data set, I can end up with a second version. Um, and I, all I have to do to update my model in production is change this from a one to a two. Um, and then you'll once that loads, you'll have a model that you can use for things um, like doing predictions on a video, which we're seeing here in the background of that's how I'm getting the up them. So with that in mind, um, we're going to download the sample app, which is essentially the entire code for this page that we're on. Um, and we're going to customize it um, to do something fun. So um, I've got a zip file here. I'll show you the contents. Um, super simple. We've got an index.html file. We've got a CSS file. And we've got a JavaScript file. And I'm going to open that up in a web browser. And we'll do a little bit of live coding here. Okay, so if we go back to our instructions, remember the first thing that we had to do is drop in the CDN link. If we open the index.html, we can see that's already been done for us. Can, can, you, can you zoom? Can you zoom a little bit? How's that? Better? Um, so we've got our, got our link from the CDN. Um, so that's loading in that RoboFlow names, namespace. And then we link the CSS and the main.js file. Um, so if I go into main.js, most of this is actually just the boilerplate code that's setting up the camera and requesting the camera permission. So if I go back into um, this zip file that I just unzipped and downloaded, um, I can open this back up. I don't know what's going to happen if I have three camera requests going on. Um, but this is, this is going to run and show us our demo with our model here, in theory. I might have to 
close my other window. Oh, of course, I didn't add my key. Um, okay, so I need to add my publishable key and my model name to the JavaScript file. Um, so if I scroll down here, there's placeholders for my key, my model name, and my version was one, so that was good to go. So now when I save the, the main.js, if I come back and refresh this, um, should ask for my camera, should load the model and we should see my thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, the sample app has the code in it for showing the boxes. Um, so this was, this was what we saw on the site. We're gonna change this to actually respond um, and do something different if I have a thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, so the way that we do that is we scroll down here and um, at the bottom is where we're actually doing the predictions. So we had above loaded the model uh, and authorized. Um, and here we've got a request animation frame that is just running this detect frame function in a loop. So you pass the video in to the model and it returns back an array of predictions. Um, so by default, it's passing it to render predictions, which is what makes those boxes. And that's actually in here. Um, it's pretty simple. It creates an HTML canvas um, just based on the X, Y positions. But we're going to get rid of that. And let's see what our predictions look like. So if I log out the predictions, I should um, approximately, well, with Zoom screen sharing, only six frames per second, but usually like 12 or 15 frames per second. Um, be getting something over here in the logs um, showing me the format um, that the model's predictions are returning. Um, so when it first first loads, um, it should be um, it should be empty because I'm not going to have my my hand on screen. So I've got an empty array here coming through every frame. But if I put my thumb on screen, um, you can see when it detects it, um, it starts returning back a single um, result. If I put two thumbs on screen, then I get two. And so if we stop in here and look at one of these, um, it's pretty simple what you get. You get the X, Y, the width and the height. You get the class, so whether it's a thumbs up or thumbs down, the color that matches what it was in the UI so that you can um, easily ballpark, like is it doing it correctly or not? And you get what's called the score. And so this is, um, you can think of this as a confidence value. Um, so how um, sure is the model that this was an up thumb right there. Um, and so you can set different thresholds of, I only want to you know, know if the model is really sure or you know, err on the side of caution and tell me if you think there might be a thumb in the frame. So with this in mind, um, we're going to respond um, to an up th a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, so I'll come back over here in, into the code. Um, and so predictions is an array. So for each prediction, uh, I'm going to come in here and um, I'm going to set a counter or set a, a variable for the last thing that I saw. And we're going to start with up as the default. And then in here, um, the, uh, the current prediction is prediction.class. Um, and so what we want to see is we want to detect a change. So is the current thing that the model is predicting different from the last thing that we saw? So um, if current is not equal last, so did we do something different? Um, then we're going to set a, uh, um, a class on the video element. Okay, and so if it's different, we're going to remove that class. So And then we're going to set, um, we're going to add the new class. And then we're going to set last equals current. So if we come in here and we get a prediction of a thumbs down, last is going to change to down and video is going to remove the, the up class and add the down class. Um, and then we're going to come in here to our CSS and um, we just want to add, 
add some styling when that happens. So video dat down, let's make it be upside down. So here, when we add the down class to the video, I'm just doing a CSS transform to, to put it upside down. Um, and so if I come back over here and refresh the page and, and load that new stuff in, um, we should have it now where um, if I put a thumbs down, it'll flip the video upside down. And if I put a thumbs up, um, the video should come back up. Um, assuming that I, I didn't make it oopsies. I think my computer is working pretty hard to be screen sharing and running two cameras at the same time. Um, okay, so I've got this. If I thumbs up, nothing should happen because it's already up. But if I thumbs down and it detects it, maybe I should have logged that out. Let's go back in here and see what's going on. If anybody spots the bug, let me know. Are you assigning the new class somewhere? Oh, yeah, where do you? Oh, prediction, okay. No, I don't see a bug. I thought I saw one. Is my element called video? That would be a good question. prediction last oh did I set it oh what am I doing I shouldn't have named this In your CSS, should it be called transform, not translate? There you go. <laughs> I love live coding. So I think it's transform. Transform. Yeah. Cool. I love it when, when it's a simple bug to fix, at least. So in theory, now, when I go thumbs down, there we go. Okay, it's upside down. And then if I go thumbs up, it should go back up. So we've created a custom um, application. I'm not really sure why it's going so slow. My laptop must be having, there we go. Could also be that we're still using the first version of the model that's not particularly good. But yeah, you could use this to do all sorts of things. So we have people like um, installing real-time models on drones to detect other drones, we have people doing counting of objects, um, we have people making games, um, kind of the sky's the limit. You can pass in any video or image object in here and essentially extract out um, custom image data about what is found in that image. Um, so I don't think our model has finished training yet. Um, well, that was a great demo on why you need diversity in teams. We're all looking at the JavaScript for the bug and it was in the CSS. True. Yeah. And, and also I think, um, we, we would probably find, um, I, I think this group was disproportionately male. Um, so I think that the, the training images wouldn't do particularly well on, on females. Um, and so, yeah, you really want to think about like when you're deploying your model, what are all the different edge cases, um, and different conditions that it, it might encounter. Um, 
and try and think of them ahead of time. But um, if not, it's really important to be able to have that iterative process where you, know, you find out, oh, shoot, you know, it's not performing well at nighttime or on women or in certain lighting. And then, you know, feed it back in and iterate and make it better and better over time. Certain amounts of melanin. Exactly. Um, I, I can't, oh, here we go. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, that was kind of the extent of the, of the demo. So hopefully um, that inspired some people. Um, yeah, we made a real-time real -time app running with uh, TensorFlow.js in the browser.